1. This takes place in October 1977. When my mom was 16, she ran away from her abusive home, along with her friend Lisa. They hitchhiked from Mass all the way to California. Obviously, this wasn't the brightest of plans, but given my mom's tumultuous home life and past experiences, she didn't see how it could be much more dangerous than anything she'd already experienced. They had a pretty safe and uneventful trip across the country, finding friends in many truck drivers and other travelers. It wasn't until they reached California when this encounter happens. The hillside strangler, at first thought to be one assailant, ended up being two men who were caught and brought to justice for ten murders. So my mom and Lisa end up meeting these two guys who were super nice to them. They crashed at their place for a few days, partying, but nothing bad had come of it at this point. These guys tell the girls that they're going to take them to the Hollywood Hills and Sunset Boulevard to see the sights. Not being from the area, my mom had no idea that these areas were more crime-ridden at that time, especially considering they were supposed to be sightseeing. My mom really wanted to see where all the movie stars lived. These guys take my mom and her friend to some divey restaurant and bar, and get them super drunk. It's also the first time my mom is introduced to and tries cocaine. After these underage girls are now completely high and drunk, they split off into pairs and my mom's friend disappears with one of these guys. My mom is now hanging out with just one of her new guy friends. He then suggests that they stand on the sidewalk on Sunset Boulevard in the middle of the night and if or when a car pulls up, she should get in and direct the driver to drive across the street to this dark parking lot. It isn't really until the first and only car pulls up and she gets in that she's realized this guy is prostituting her out. Keep in mind these guys had been nothing but kind and respectful to my young mom and friend for the past few days. Also, and very sadly, this type of abuse is not a new concept for her either. She gets into this car and instead of pulling into the parking lot, he keeps driving straight. My mom explains that he's gone the wrong way, so he starts driving faster. My mom moves toward the door, but he locks it, hits her, and attempts to hold her down all at the same time. He tells her she isn't going anywhere. My mom knew in her head she needed to get out of that car, or she'd be dead. So in one swift move, she unlocks the door, tucks and rolls out of the car. His car comes screeching to a halt. She sees some bushes in front of a house, so she runs to hide behind them. He's turned around looking for her, creeping along. His passenger side was facing where she was hiding, and she was peeking through the bushes. She saw he had a gun. As soon as his car crept by, she ran to the backyard. It was all fenced in. There was no other way out, so she had to go back the way she came. By the time she crawled back into the bushes to see if he was still around, she saw his car had gone to the end of the road and turned back around. So he passes again, and when she thought he was far enough away, she crawled out of the bushes to run. But then she sees his brake lights. Confident that he's now seen her, she runs as fast as possible around a corner. But she could hear his car, so she had to duck and hide behind parked cars on the road. As soon as he passes again, she booked it across the street, which took her through the parking lot she was originally supposed to park in, and back to her friend. The creep did circle back again, but by then she was with her friend and they were leaving the area. My mom and her friend quickly ditched these two assholes and did find a safer place to stay, but only a short time later did my mom call home and eventually made it home safely. It wasn't until a long time later that she saw on the news a story about women being murdered and recognized the murderer. Dubbed the Hillside Strangler as the man who had picked her up that night. A side note, my mom literally just dictated this story to me. I've heard it before, but not in so much detail. I told her about this sub, and she said I should share her story. Not purposefully, but I googled an image of the hillside strangler and showed her. Unexpectedly, my phone and she jumped so high. 
It actually really unnerved her recognizing him again. I feel bad about that. Edit. It was Kenneth Bianchi who drove the car this night. My mom said there is no questioning that it was his distinguishing features and definitely his mustache. Edit 2. I've been reading these comments to my mom retelling her story to me so I could accurately account for it. Has stirred some anxiety and feelings in her she didn't realize were there. So she just wants to say a genuine thank you for all the well wishes and positive comments. I hope she finds comfort in knowing that, although it was because of poor choices, hitchhiking and drinking with strangers, her actions show how truly brave and strong she was and is. Honestly, I'm so grateful for her. She is the most amazing woman I have ever known. 2. On February of 2016, I had someone pretending to be me and talking to my family. Let me explain. He saved my photos and made a fake profile with my name, then sent friend requests to my family. He spoke to them and even asked my father for a picture of us together. Later, he asked me, Historia Ymir, why do you ask for a picture of us together? And I was like, what do you mean? And no one thought it was weird. My mom actually noticed that the account was false when I was talking to her in front of her and the account was also talking to her on Messenger. The guy who did this disappeared, but it was stressful and made me start using fake names since he found my family using my surname and city. So, December. Finally, 2016 was ending, and I thought I was finally getting some peace. I was told that someone was using my photos for catfishing, and the person simply apologized and said that they were administrating a Facebook page which posted photos of girls and blah blah blah. I was like, yeah, okay, just don't post my pics. And I accepted the person's friend request, since he deleted my photo. Her name was Danny. Danny was kind of weird. Whenever we spoke, she would ask personal things or for feet pictures, which I never sent since it was annoying, but I never doubted her or anything. To me, she was an ordinary girl with some weird foot fetish. I kept that thought until my friend told me to stay away from her because she actually was a 21-year-old man who stalked girls and pretended to be them. She told me her experience. He stole my friend's pictures, then made a fake profile with them and started to report her profile. After that, the fake profile started to add lots of people and became famous. She stopped using her real name and photos due to that. She told me to watch out. The thing is, she told me that the guy did this not only to her, but to lots of girls. Back in 2016, he had around 5 or 10 fake profiles, which no one doubted that they were fake. After I cut contact with Danny, she created another account just to ask me why I blocked her. And, well, the more profiles I blocked, the more profiles appeared. There was a point where he made a profile with my friend's name and picture, and pretended to be her. But I knew that it was Danny all along. I was scared, but since nothing happened, I simply relaxed and hoped for the best. My account was reported for pretending to be someone else, and therefore was deactivated. But who the hell was I pretending to be? Well, that's when I discovered that Danny stole my pictures and started using them. She would also say stuff like, I only add white people and disgusting Nazi stuff. I wanted to punch her, or better, his face. Her photos would get around 500 to 700 likes, and whenever I tried to create another profile, someone would say that I was pretending to be Danny and report me. She also would ask people to report my profile because I was the one pretending to be her. It was easy to believe her, since my profile was recent, because it's hard to get your account back by sending your ID when you use a fake name. And she had lots of photos and videos of me. Danny would make profiles of my friends and send messages like, I got blocked, can't talk here, just so I would send friend requests. Then she would steal more pictures. Anyway, it all ended when I made a live stream on one of my accounts and started to talk about what happened. People believed me and Danny's profile was deactivated. 
Yay. Or so I thought. After some days of peace, a girl named Victoria was using my photo. On her profile, it would show that she was a girl with red hair and green eyes. Actually, she changed her hair a lot. She was tagged in a family picture, in which her tag was on a little blonde girl. My experience with Danny fucked me up, so I started doubting Victoria's existence and asked her to take my pic off. She was like, I can't, and not now. My patience was wearing off, but my friends actually believed that she was a little girl. Anyway, one of my friends asked her for a real picture since she was using my photo. She sent, but I knew something was weird, because my other friend did the same thing and she sent the photo of a totally different girl. Spoiler, it was Danny again, the 21-year-old guy who had nothing to do but stalk girls. The same thing happened. She reported my profile and started to use my pictures. No one really believed that she was a catfish except my friends. No matter what I did, she would report all my profiles. I lost a lot of profiles. She would even steal pictures from my Instagram. You know, I'm in the middle of a story, but let me too long didn't read it for you. A 21-year-old guy pretends to be girl, so he started to pretend to be me and report all my profiles. Also, would say Nazi-like stuff. This may not sound creepy, but, well, let me continue. There was another profile named Victoria. She was an Asian girl who would post lots of sexy and insinuating photos. But the thing was that she would always say that she was underage. And asked when she said that she was less than 10 years old. And her photos were basically nudes. I would always get sick looking at her profile because I knew it was a 21-year-old man. At the same time, Danny's profile was reactivated. You know when someone dies and then the profile gets some kind of memorial? That's what she did. That way, no one would report her profile. At that point, I didn't know what to do. My parents wouldn't let me report it to the police. And my profiles were getting reported. That's when I noticed that Danny's profile was using my old Tumblr's URL. I used it to create a blog talking about what Danny and Victoria did to me, and it kind of worked. Lots of people discovered the truth about those profiles. To be honest, there isn't much left to tell besides the fact that he still stalks all my friends and me. We aren't sure about what we should do. Some people say that the police may help, but they were already contacted and nothing happened. The guy disappeared for now, but... I know he will return. It's been a year since it all happened, and I don't think it's going to stop. Since he stalks my friend since three years ago. But for now, let's not meet, you creep. 3. A little background. My dad is a police officer, ex-military, and my mom is one of those types of people who worries about literally everything. This led to them teaching me how to behave in a variety of potentially dangerous situations. From code words to self-defense. I wish I were kidding, but we even have a plan for a zombie apocalypse. Literally any potential disaster, we've discussed it. Fortunately, I lived a very safe life and did not have to use her advice very often. I'm also an incredibly light sleeper. Even a text vibration on my phone wakes me up immediately. During the summer before my third year of college, I was living with a good friend of mine. We can call her E. E was very book smart, but somehow had zero situational awareness, as well as a horrible tendency to be the most annoying person you've met in your life after having one drink. At the time of this story, I was 20 and she was already 21. This led to a few nights of me getting pissed off because she would choose to go to the cooler bars her other friends wanted to go to, but that I couldn't get into with my shitty fake. This particular night we had talked about going out, and had even gotten ready together. Then right before we were supposed to leave, she switched it up and decided she was actually going to go meet her other friends at a bar. I couldn't go to, and oh I'm so sorry. I wasn't about to tell her she can't do something, but walked away visibly pissed and went to bed early. I woke up at around 3 because I had received a few texts in a row. Knowing it was her, I was extremely tempted to turn over and go back to bed. 
I decided to quick check and see what she wanted, and saw multiple separate texts from E that said things like, Oh my god, wake up, please wake up, I'm in so much trouble. Please help me, etc, etc. Unfortunately, I've gotten a new phone since this happened, and don't have access to the original texts. I ask her what was happening, and she tells me, with lots of misspellings, because... Alcohol? That her friends left her at the bar, they didn't answer when she tried to call them. And that while she was standing outside the bar trying to call her friends, two older guys asked if she needed help. She told them she was just trying to get a hold of her friends, so she could go home. To this day, I question why she didn't just order an Uber when she realized she was alone, but... Alcohol... These two men point to a car and say it's their Uber, and if she'd like, they don't mind dropping her off at home. E decides this sounds like a great idea, and gets into the car with them. One guy sits up front with the driver, and one sits in the back with E. This is obviously when things start to go south. E notices that they appear to be going the wrong direction, and makes a comment that she lives the other way. No one says anything to her. Now the car has exited onto a major highway that you would take if you wanted to leave our large city for the neighboring large city, approximately 45 minutes away. This is the point where she started texting me for help. I tell her she needs to speak up, but she keeps telling me that she's too afraid to say anything. I tell her to say that she's going to be sick. No Uber driver will want you puking in the car and will pull over so you can get out. This is what my mom had drilled into my head as a kid. If you don't like something someone is doing in a car, tell them you're going to be sick. She refuses because she's too afraid. E finally asks where they're going and they say, large city. She tells them, no, I live in other city. And the guys laugh and say, well, just think of it as a suburb of other city. Now E has gone into full panic mode. I've already run out of the house and I'm attempting to follow them. I have her sending me her location on the iPhone repeatedly, so I can try and catch them. I'm repeatedly telling her to get the fuck out of the car and do not get back in. I was flying down the highway, but they still had maybe a 20 minute head start. I wanted to call the police because one, we obviously need help, and two, I'm driving in excess of 100 miles per hour down the highway and do not want to be pulled over. Unfortunately, E can't even give me a description of what car she's in. No color, no make, nothing. I don't know how she finally spoke up or what she even said, but she was able to get the Uber driver to stop at a gas station that was, quite literally, the only thing around. Like it was an exit to a gas station just to enter back onto the highway. There was nothing else in the area. She's texting me to tell me they're pulling into a gas station and I tell her to get her ass into a bathroom stall, lock the door, and do not move until I get there, and if she can't do that, go stand next to the clerk and tell him to call the police because she does not know these men, but I swear to God, E, do not get back into the car. I don't care if they carry you kicking and screaming. You fight tooth and nail to stay out of the car. But of course, this is E, and she did not listen. She instead chose to hide behind the gas station. At this point, I was just minutes away and figured I could get there before they went looking for her. I was a 20-year-old female, average to shorter height and average weight. Athletic, but not a hulk by any means. So I have no idea what I thought I would be able to do to these two 30-year-old men and their Uber driver. I had also ran out of bed without getting dressed, so I was wearing... Fleece Guitar Hero pajama pants and a sports bra, no shoes. I pull into the gas station parking lot, and their car is the only one there. I got out of my car and marched up to the one standing by the gas station wall, and, quite literally, went toe to toe with him, and in my best low, cold, furious anger voice, asked him where E was and what the hell he thought he was doing. This grown man couldn't look me in the eyes, and didn't bother speaking, but rather pointed to the back of the building. I yelled to E to get out here now. We are going home. She comes around the building wearing only her bra and jeans, no shirt. I put her in my car and turn around to start yelling at the men, 
but as I turned, their Uber was already squeaking tires to get out of the station. E and I had a very quiet ride home, where I turned into my mother and told her that I wasn't mad at her. She was crying and apologizing to me. And she was safe now, but next time she needs to react quickly and speak up for herself, because who knows what could have happened. Oh, and she didn't have a shirt on because there was a hill behind the gas station that she fell down and into a bramble patch, and her shirt was covered in stickers. This story isn't as outright terrifying as most of the ones I read on this sub, but thinking about what could have happened, had I not caught up with them, and just how easy it was for them to do this, chills me to the bone. So to my friends too, would-be rapists and kidnappers, let's not meet. For your sake. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 266. Thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. And I would like to extend a special and specific thanks to the author of story number one and their mother for their great kindness in allowing me to use their story. I appreciate that it's not an easy thing to talk about, but I was very grateful that you allowed me to share it on my channel. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.